These two episodes released in 1960, which is the same year that Psycho was released. That'll be more relevant later. Uh, let's get to it, shall we? Those are the doors. That is a chair with a panda on it. Washington, D.C., and you with it. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. We start our first episode in one of those phone booths in a bar. There's a line of stereotypical theater characters waiting on Roger Shackleforth, a young man who seems to be robo-dialing in search of the woman of his dreams. When he finally reaches the woman, Layla, she expresses absolutely no interest in him. Why don't you take a flying jump at the moon? An impatient man pays his way to the front of the line, and then pulls Roger out of the booth after handing him a business card for someone who will solve all his problems. Someone with the reassuring name of a demon. He goes to a demon's surreal library and meets with Sheriff Chambers to talk about the old Bates house. I mean, he meets with Professor Demon to discover he's some kind of apothecary. Demon tries to sell him a murder potion he calls Glove Cleaner, presumably because it keeps blood off your hands, but all Roger Shackleforth wants is a love potion. The professor assures him he can sell him one for a mere dollar that will make Layla utterly and fantastically infatuated with him, no matter what Roger does to her. Demon makes another push to upsell him on murder, but Roger leaves with only the love potion. Later, Roger shows up at Layla's door with flowers and champagne, forcing his way in despite the obvious signs that she thinks he's a hopeless creep. So, like a creep, he goes ahead and roofies her, and stares at her while he waits for it to take effect. Layla then tries to make it as crystal clear as she can that she has no interest in him. I don't love you. I don't want you here. I don't even like you at the moment. Now please go! Then, as Roger finally turns to leave, Layla suddenly succumbs to the potion and embraces him. Fast forward a bit, and Layla has married Rusty Shackleford and is now tending to his every desire without falling afoul of the Code of Practices for Television Broadcasters' moral sensibilities. I adore touching you. <laughs> I'd be glad to rub it again. Uh, no, thanks, Layla. Predictably, all this fawning and subservience is exhausting, so Roger runs off to see the professor. Demon, completely unsurprised to see him, assures the young husband that there is no way to alter the effects of the love potion. He then once again tries to sell him the quote-unquote glove cleaner for the bargain price of $1,000. When Roger resists, Demon uses the Mandalorian code against him. This is the way. Naturally, Roger buys it, even though it costs his entire life savings, and he then returns home to his adoring wife. He once again tries to slipper a Mickey even worse than the mouse, but before he can go through with it, Layla reveals that she is pregnant, and Roger drops the drinks, now forced to live the rest of his life being smothered by the consequences of his own actions. This episode is fine as it goes, but I don't really love it. If I look at it like an academic, and analyze it for its socio-political implications as it relates to the time period's conception of love and marriage, or look into its themes about the dangers of unchecked desire, I could certainly find a lot to talk about, and have fun doing so. But honestly, at the end of the day, it's just a genie's curse story that boils down to a simple, be careful what you wish for. Like I said, that's fine, and I don't find anything to actively dislike about it, but for me, the episode is pretty lackluster and forgettable. Pretty ugly situation we've got. With China, don't you think? Hey, great coffee. It's instant Folgers. Doesn't it taste good as fresh perked? Better than those girls make at the office. Honey, their coffee can't hold a candle to yours. Instant Folgers taste good as fresh perked. Try it. Joey Crown is an alcoholic musician standing outside the back entrance to a jazz club where they can only play in major keys. 
He is hoping to get a gig with his old pal Baron, but apparently the last time they played together, Joey was too drunk to perform. Joey almost convinces Baron that he's changed and sobered up, but the bottle of whiskey that falls out of his trumpet case tells a different story. Baron gives Joey some money and compliments his skill, but still says no, leading to a monologue from Joey about what his music means to him and why he has to drink to make his life bearable. Jack Klugman is far and away the main reason to watch this episode. His acting here is breathtakingly good. Um, he's had a lot of good performances in his career, and he'll show up again in this show a few times. But for my money, this is some of his best work. After Baron leaves, Joey sits in the alley and plays some maudlin notes, but can't seem to find the highs, which is thematically appropriate. Later, he sells his horn for some booze money, and apparently it's not the first time. He then proceeds to get drunk at a bar called The Bandwagon, which, let's face it, is a great name for a bar, and then reflects on the sad state of his existence. As such, he makes the snap decision to step out in front of a passing truck. When he awakes, he tries to explain himself to a nearby cop, only for the police officer to completely ignore him. Joey then walks down to the movie theater, where several other people fail to react to him. When he notices that he doesn't cast a reflection, he goes through all five stages of grief before concluding he must be dead. I don't mean to spoil things too early, but if you pay attention, you'll notice a lot of fun clues, like the fact that people don't even react to each other, or the fact that Joey doesn't recognize people in places where he probably should. I used to come in there a lot. Of course, I don't recognize any of you people. We get another long Klugman monologue as he hugs a jukebox, revealing a reflection, before he makes his way back to the jazz club. There, he hears an incredible trumpet and follows it to see California Charlie hanging out in the alleyway. That's two cameos from secondary characters in Psycho. Coincidence? Yeah, probably. The trumpeter, who looks like Abraham Lincoln without his hat, can not only see and interact with Joey, but he knows his name and all about him. He lets Joey play with his horn, and suddenly, Joey can hit all the right notes again. Joey tries to figure out who the mysterious horn player is, and the man explains that Joey isn't actually dead, but is in some kind of middle ground between life and death. You know, like a twilight, uh, area. All the people around them are actually dead, living out their previous life until they are ready to pass on. Joey, though, still has a choice to go back, and so he chooses life. The mysterious trumpeter passes on some wisdom about recognizing the good things, and then finally reveals his name. Gabe. Short for Gabriel. You know, Gabriel with his horn. Please tell me I don't have to explain that. And so Joey wakes up right after being hit by the truck, none the worse for wear and apparently completely sober. The driver wants to avoid any kind of insurance trouble and pays Joey off to stay quiet, money that Joey then uses to buy back his horn. Later, he is playing away on the roof and meets a new woman who shows interest. The episode ends, implying there is love for these two in the future. I do really like this episode, and I respect what it's trying to do in a very short amount of time, but the turn is a little too neat. What I mean is that it doesn't feel like Joey actually gets reminded of why life is worth living, and he doesn't actually have to fight to get back to it, with his alcoholism and his crippling loneliness completely brushed aside in the blink of an eye. But, like I said, this is nevertheless a really good episode, highlighted by Klugman's performance. And that's all I have on The Chaser and A Passage for Trumpet. Now, as always, do all those youtube -y things, Check out my Patreon. Yeah, do it. And all that other good YouTube stuff. But until next time, this is the Unapologetic Geek telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody. <laughs>